Oh God, once again we come to you this on a Sunday asking that you open our hearts and minds with the power and presence of your very spirit so as the scriptures are proclaimed we may hear with joy what you have to say to us this day for we ask it in your son's name amen there's a story from some time ago about a young salesman out of the Midwest selling encyclopedias. Of course, we know that doesn't happen today. You know, we, things like that are done online, and there's websites you can go to and get all the information about that's contained in an encyclopedia. But this is many years ago, and he's wandering around in the Midwest in the Corn Belt. And every dirt road seemed like the last dirt road, and every corner seemed like the last corner. And he happened upon this little run-down building, this little mom-and-pop grocery store service station with the Mae West uh, pumps out front, and the wood used to have paint on it. And he gets out of his car and goes in, and it's real dark and dreary inside. There's a man standing behind the counter, reading a paper. There's a pickle barrel and there's a glassed-in refrigerated uh, bar in the back with hoop cheese and, you know, uh, uh, sliced deli meat in there and on top crackers. And on the floor was this old blue tick hound sound asleep. And being a dog lover, the young man walked over to the dog, but before He did anything. He asked the man behind the counter, does your dog bite? And the man said, no. And so the young man leans over and he starts rubbing the old dog on top of the head. Finally, the dog wakes up, snaps at the young man's hand, and the young man is surprised and and shocked, and he turns to the fellow behind the counter, and he says, I thought you said your dog doesn't bite. And the man said he doesn't. Well, how do you explain what he just did? Well, that's not my dog. (laughs) This section of Mark's gospel forces the reader to ask some very uncomfortable questions. For instance, are we willing to, for the sake of God, For the sake of the kingdom of God, for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, are we willing to be called unacceptable by our culture and our society? Are we willing to be considered disruptive and insensitive by the postmodern world, you know, toward its value system and its social norms, and its ethical schemes? Are we willing to pursue the leadings of the Galilean into the unfamiliar? Unfamiliar situations, unfamiliar circumstances, uncomfortable situations, uncomfortable situations that may cost us family relationships, may cost us friends, may cost us social position, and may or may cost us promotion at work. For to do so, if we truly follow the carpenter with more than just lip service, it can very well cost us immensely just like it did Jesus. It will see us as a threat, society, postmodern day society will see us as a threat, an unstable nuisance, if you will, a nuisance to its designs and its goals and its purposes. For you see, just about everything Jesus stood for the postmodern world stands against. 
And just about everything the postmodern world cherishes and considers valuable, Christ opposed. To the world, it seems crazy to believe in God. At least that's what our postmodern idols have said. Bill Gates once said, just in terms of allocation of time and resources, religion is not very efficient. There's a lot more I could do on Sunday morning. Ted Turner, an atheist, once described Christianity as a religion for losers. Therefore, it's ridiculous to sacrifice your time and to sacrifice your energy, to sacrifice your finances for a God that may or may not exist. The crazy faithful, however, not only believe in God, they believe this God was in the carpenter from Galilee. And this carpenter from Galilee has demonstrated the noble, righteous way to live and interact with this world and others. They believe his teachings. And thus they believe the first shall be last and the last shall be first. They believe to be great is to be a servant to all. They believe what makes one prodigious in the kingdom of God is not what one has, but one's generosity to others. The how we treat the misfortunate. How we deal with the underprivileged. So the rich are poor, and the poor are rich. The strong are weak, and the weak are strong. And they believe the greatest expression of love is to lay down one's life for another, and the greatest expression for us is to be willing to express that love when it's called upon. Sort of like a veteran. The world looks at this sad lot of Jesus' followers and the world shakes its collective head and thinks it that those who follow are religious fanatics, lunatics, demented, deranged, duped, if you will, and misguided. Yes, misguided souls to the world. However, to the Lord of life, children of God, to the Lord of life, disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, I wasn't anti-social as a teenager. I just didn't find people all that interesting. Those I did, I wanted to be near. And those I didn't find very interesting, I didn't want anything to do with them. So my best friend as a teenager in, in all of God's creation was Sam. Sam and I were best buds. Everywhere I went, Sam went too. We even double dated together at times. We fished and we hunted together. When I ran in the summer trying to get ready for football season, Sam ran with me, encouraging me along the way. Sam was loving, he was kind, he had real dark brown eyes and goldish red hair, uh, and he loved to sleep a lot. That was the only aggravating thing about Sam. He just loved to sleep a lot. But we were close. If I had something to eat, he had something to eat. He was upbeat. He was energetic. And when he was, you know, and when he wasn't sleeping. Uh, Sam was interested. And Sam was interesting. Yep, we were best friends, even though Sam was a golden retriever. His personality 
Well, we're going to be here a long time now. That was the bulletin. So. <laughs> Sam's personality was energetic, and it was level. When the little dogs, the little chihuahuas would bark at him, he'd just stick up his head like this and just let them bark. He didn't bother him. And when the big dogs came at him, he just stood his ground. He knew a few commands, sit, you know, roll over. But my favorite command was sick them. And if I pointed to a pine tree and said, sick him, he would go after the pine tree. That's just the way he was. And he was so loyal to me, so into me, that when my dad wanted to have a prayer meeting with me that usually left me speaking in tongues, he'd had to put in a, he had to put Sam in another room because Sam did not like those prayer meetings. Sam was loyal and very dedicated. He was completely devoted and committed. And as I think about the qualities that Jesus expects towards him from us, I think about Sam. I think about how loyal, how committed, how dedicated he was to me. And I have to say this, and it hurts me to say this, but Sam was more loyal to me than we are as Christians toward the kingdom and the gospel. Because if we were that loyal to the kingdom and the gospel, there wouldn't be an empty seat in this sanctuary. There wouldn't be a hungry belly in Myrtle Beach. And no one would be homeless. Jesus consistently turned conventional wisdom up side down, inside out, and front to back, and back to front. And many who heard his physical observations turned into a, a spiritual lesson, thought he had absolutely lost his mind. Go back and read the Gospels. His own family thought he had lost his mind, and they go to get him and bring him home. They knew how foolish the disciples were too. Think about that for a second. One day they're out there fishing and this young rabbi shows up on the shore and he says a few words to them and then says, follow me. And they climb out of their boat and they start following this, this rabbi off into the wilderness, leaving their families behind. Children, wives, other relatives and friends. They walked away. That's crazy. And then they made themselves vulnerable to the hostility and humiliation that Jesus attracted. They risked their very lives to, to follow him. And those on the outside assumed they had lost their mind, that they had been bitten by a rabid rabbi. Now, you'd think God's people of that day would have been used to God taking sane people and making them crazy. You would think that they would be accustomed to God turning the common, agreed-upon social norms and standards upside down. But it's not so. They're shocked in our text this morning. But Judaism has a long line of crazy people in its religious pedigree. For instance, there is Abraham and Sarah who are in their 90s. And God calls them to start a family and be the source, the resource for the entire Hebrew nation. In their 90s. Folks, that's crazy. Then when God hears the cry of his children in Egypt, he sends a 70-year-old, thick-tongued murderer to Egypt to free his people. He chose Joshua to take a bunch of brick makers up against some of the most sophisticated armies and fortified cities in the world at that time. Crazy. God's crazies are numerous. Think of Deborah and, uh, uh, and Ruth and Elijah and Elijah and, and Jeremiah and Nehemiah and Jonah. Think about Amos and, and Esther and Hosea and David and Solomon. They all did crazy things after God whispered in their soul. 
Even God did something a little crazy, don't you think? When God decided to enter this world, he came without pomp or circumstance. There was no worldwide announcement. He didn't come with cosmic power and might. No flashes of lightning. No rolling thunder. I wonder how it would have been if an event, event planner had planned the emergence of the cosmic God into human history. I bet, I bet there would have been a long parade of people waiting to get into the palace nursery. And that palace nursery has fine linen and, and purple robes, fine jewelry. And I bet, you know, the, the emperor would be uh, masculine and, and, and beautiful, and the empress would be uh, the toast of the entire empire. The world's top reporters would be there jotting down every little uh, tidbit. And, of course, all the beautiful people of Rome would be interviewed. Instead, he enters human history as a helpless baby, born to a powerless couple from a backwater town called Nazareth. There's no entourage, no entourage, just obscurity, no linen, just burlap, no audience at the nursery. Just creatures of the field in a stall. That was crazy. But the craziness continues. In his book, The Comic Vision and the Christian Faith, the author Conrad Heyer asked the question, Who, after all, are the people that march in the biblical parade? They are not those at the center of the world's attention. They are not kings and queens and rulers of Rome, Babylon, Persia, and Egypt. Neither are they poets and philosophers of Greece. They were not those who commanded the great armies of the world either. Those who marched in God's parade were children, shepherds, fishermen, gypsies, and sick and maimed, and the wretched refuse of society since God said, let there be light. God's parade, as seen by the world, is a spectacle of human tragedy. It's a long, vanishing line of maimed, of blind, lame, the shutouts, the shut-ins, the put-downs, the put-outs, the marginalized, the powerless. It's a long parade of nobodies, and rank-and-file sinners who responded to God's grace and mercy and risked being called fools, idiots, and crazies for following Jesus, the Lord of life, in the way. It's God's parade. And God's parade, every, in God's parade, everything seems tossed and turned on its head. The entire system of values, secular values, levels of human greatness, of self-importance are inverted, and they collapse. Servants lead God's parade. Given to the nameless nobodies are the prime seats around the banquet. Slaves become chosen people, and the despised human rubbish become the inheritors of the entire world. Let us not forget that when God began his ministry to the world, he did it in the life of an obscure Galilean carpenter by the name of Yeshua, Jesus, who called smelly fishermen to be his followers. Now, we just finished our stewardship emphasis. Our theme was together we can do more. Hopefully, prayerfully, you completed your time and talent survey and your, and your pledge card. Because when you became members of this church, you made promises and obligations to support it with who you are, what you are, and what you have. 
The survey and pledge cards are just ways to remind us of those pledges and those obligations. They're, they're, a, way, they're a way of reminding us of our priorities, that instead of giving God what's left over, we give God what is first. It's also a way of sharing in ministry and mission to which every one of us has been called. When you became a Christian, you were called to be a minister. Each one of you have your own ministry. And no one else can do it for you. Not the paid clergy, not the staff, not your children, your grandchildren, or any other relative. It is yours to do. It is ours together to reach the goal. And what's the goal? To make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. God knows how hard it is. Remember, God in Christ experienced the temptations in the wilderness. God in Christ felt the sting of the slander of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the rabbinics. God felt the betrayal and, and the want to be with those disciples in the garden. So God knows the, the doubts that we have. And the, he knows that the world whispers in our ears 24-7 about how crazy we are. How can you give your hard-earned and tightly managed money to a church? You could be saving that for special things. Why, you could give away your time to something that makes, gives you something back in return. You could be traveling you know, going to ball games, sitting at the 50-yard line on the lower level, sleeping in on Sunday morning. Why not use that church time for yourself? You deserve it. That's crazy, isn't it? Jesus calls us to love our enemy. Get that. To do good to those who despitefully use us and abuse us. How crazy is that? He calls us to be forgiving unlimitedly. Seventy times seven, he says. And if we do that, we're going to get used. How crazy is that? He calls us to not only give our coat, but to give our cloak as well. To not just walk a mile, but walk the second and third mile. How crazy is that? To love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. And get this, to love our neighbor as ourself. How crazy is that? Interesting, Jesus paid no stock in the religious show-offs and show-outs who bragged about what they gave and what they had done. You know, the ones who wore the fine robes and, and prayed the long prayers. Jesus says their main interest was grabbing and getting. So instead, he sat there in that outer court of the temple one day, and he watched that poor widow come in. And I imagine she's wearing rags. And she comes in, and she quietly, without any notoriety, puts everything she has, which is one penny, one penny into the temple treasury. And you know what? She didn't ask for a plaque to be put on the wall memorializing the act. How crazy is that? Now what is she going to do? Maybe the world is on spot. Maybe what we believe, what we are called to do, how we are to do it is irrational and is illogical. Maybe it's senseless and juvenile and idiotic. Maybe, maybe it just is crazy. You know, faith will do that sort of thing to you. It makes all of us just a little bit crazy. Faith makes us crazy enough to do things for Jesus simply because we've experienced his love and his grace and his mercy. The experience of love and grace has made us crazy enough to forget the judgments of the world and care less about what the world thinks about us and more about what God thinks about us. I 
I'm going to close with a story. I heard recently about an unusual high school football game played in Grapevine, Texas, between Grapevine Faith Academy and Gainesville State. Faith Academy is a Christian school, of course, in Gainesville, and is located, uh, uh, Faith Academy is, in, uh, is a, a Christian school in Gainesville. The uh, State Academy, well, it's within barbed wire and a high fence. It's a state federal school correctional facility. The prison team only had 14 players. And all their equipment was outdated. You know, in, in school, the junior varsity gets the hands off of the varsity. Well, this team got the handoffs from the junior varsity. So everything is well-worn and outdated. And there's only 14 on the team. Uh, their record was 0 and 8. They'd only scored once that entire season. And the kids ranged in legal problems from not attending school, truancy, uh, to assault, to um, stealing cars and shoplifting and all kinds of other things. Um, many had families that had completely disowned them. And they... Uh, wore tennis shoes instead of football cleats. Now, Faith Academy, on the other hand, had the best of all equipment. Their record was 7-2, and two, and they had 70 players on their team. And the coach at Faith Academy knew what was going to happen when they played the Gainesville State team. And the, and the Gainesville team would have no fans, and it would be no contest. So the coach of Faith Academy said, what if half our fans and half our cheerleaders cheered for the other team? He sent out an email to the faithful fans asking them to do just that. He said, here's the message I want to send. You're just as valuable as any other person on the planet. Some thought he was confused. Some thought he had lost his mind. Some thought he was absolutely crazy. One player said, Coach, why are we doing this? And the coach said, Imagine you don't have a home life. No one loves you. No one pulling for you. Imagine that everyone pretty much had given up on you. Now imagine what it would feel like suddenly to have hundreds of people believing in you and supporting you. The idea took root. And on the night of the game, imagine if you were one of those 14, running out onto the field and the cheerleaders have you a banner to run through. They had never done anything like that before. And the cheerleaders are cheering, and they run the team to their side of the field, and they're over there cheering, and the bleachers are filled cheering those 14 players, calling them by name. They took the time to learn their name. Well, after the game, the teams gathered at the 50-yard line to pray, and, and that's when Isaiah, one of the con convicts, stepped forward and he says, I'd like to lead the prayer. And it shocked everyone, and they said, sure. And here's what he prayed. Lord, I don't know what just happened. So I don't know how or who to say thank you to. But I never knew there were so many people in the world who cared about us. So thank you. On the way back to the bus, under guard, each one of the players was handed a burger and fries, a Coke, candy bar, and a Bible. There had to be Rotarians in the audience. I mean, um, uh, what an incredible act of selfless servanthood. What an absolutely crazy thing to have done. Gideon's in the... Martin Luther said, I have held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But the things I have placed in God's hands, 
I still possess. Or as Jim Elliott, who was martyred at 28, his uh, wife wrote in his journal when he was 22, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Were they crazy? God calls us today to be faith-filled people who refuse to give yesterday's answers to tomorrow's problems. God calls us to be to the unexpected and to seek new possibilities, to stand on our tiptoes and peek over the horizon and then prepare ourselves to meet that horizon in faith with courage. God calls us to a loyalty this world can never understand and to dedicate ourselves to that which seems silly and antiquated, even crazy. Isn't it time for you and me to throw off the delusion of social acceptability and get just a little bit crazy for Christ? Let's get really crazy around here. Amen.